Um, well, uh, I'm delighted to be here. Um, Atlanta, I did grow up in Atlanta, and it's always a wonderful homecoming to be here and um, to be participating in this event for the Atlanta Review. A big congratulations to Dan Beach and all of those um, people who have worked so hard at it over the years. Um, I wasn't there at the very beginning. I was not involved in the clay eater discussion. But um, early on, um, I remember those late night proofreading sessions. And, um, but it's really wonderful that this magazine has done so well. And I know that it's one of the few magazines that readers enjoy reading and poets are pleased to be in. That is one of the, the rarest, I think, of all <laughs> poetry journal categories. Um, since we're here in the Bill Moore Student Success Center, is that correct? Um, uh, Dan thought perhaps I should read a poem about academic failure. <laughs> the School of Dreams. It is an afternoon with chalk dust in the light. The dusk is coming soon and the answer is not right. The answer is not right, and the bell is going to ring, and red ink like a blight has tainted everything. The leaves upon the trees, the leaves that fall and rest, the light that, by degrees, is failing in the west. Everything will burn with the shade of shame, because it is your turn, because you hear your name and cannot solve for why. Minutes go to waste, the slate blank as a sky and perfectly erased. The bell is going to chime. There's nothing you can do but to flip a dime between false and true. The problem still remains. It isn't what you think. Failures in your veins, red as any ink. Um. I did fly here from Greece um, with my husband about a week ago and our 18-month-old child. It was an experience for everyone on the plane. <laughs> he could not be with us tonight because he is busy with his grandmother. Um, so I will read this poem, Jet Lag. Oriented, suddenly Aurora I rise without alarm in the random dark, already full of purpose, without coffee or tea, to the cat's delight, revving her pleasure. Breakfast is a poem light in good measure, a grapefruit split to reveal the spokes and rays of the sunburst wheels on a golden chariot. I dress, I shake the dewdrops from tips of my tresses. It is as if I can hear them Imagined horses, a stir in the stable, fogging the air with their breath, snug under blankets, awaiting the curry comb and oats, ready to set out over the hill, over the sleeping city, over the sill of the sea, islands dribbled like pancake batter. Knowing where I am is always east, always ahead of the day that's going to matter. This is a, a poem on a very old theme. So I have entitled it, Variations on an Old Standard. Um, generally, poems on this particular theme, um, sort of, uh, time is short. So uh, let's get friendly. Um, are written by men, but uh, <laughs> I thought I'd try my hand at it. Variations on an old standard. Come let us kiss. This cannot last. Too late is on its way too soon, and we are going nowhere fast. Already it is afternoon, that momentary palindrome. The midday hours start to swoon. Around the corner lurks the gloam. The sun flies at half-mast and flags. The color guard of bees heads home, whizzing by in zigs and zags, weighed down by the dusty gold they've hoarded in their saddlebags all the summer they can hold. It is too late to be too shy. The present tenses starts to scold, 
Tomorrow has no alibi and hides its far side like the moon. The bats inebriate the sky. And now mosquitoes start to tune their tiny violins. I see, rising like a gray balloon, the head that does not look at me, and in its face the shadow cast, the sea they call tranquility, dry and desolate and vast, where all passions flow at last. Come, let us kiss. It's afternoon, and we are going nowhere fast. Um, I write a lot uh, in, in traditional forms. Um, I, I have enough problems making decisions, um, so it's nice that some of them are made for you <laughs> in a traditional form, you know, like a sonnet. You have 140-odd syllables to work with. Um, I write a lot in traditional forms, and um, a lot of these traditional forms start off as song forms and then become adapted by the poets. So this is one of these uh, song forms that has been adapted for literary use, and it is entitled Bad News Blues. When bad news comes to town, hold on to your heart. When bad news comes to town, the troubles start. He's a hit, marked with a bullet, climbing the chart. His smile swings open like a pocket knife. He smiles like he could slice right through a life. Nobody's daughter is safe, nobody's wife. He plays the odds. He needs just half a chance. Sooner or later, he'll ask you to dance. He gets his own way like an ambulance. He's got your number and he dials direct. He's calling you long distance and collect. You gasp, something is wrong, somebody's wrecked. He's standing outside your door, it's quarter to three. You know he's out there and it's quarter to three. There is no knock, he's got the skeleton key. Another, I write quite a lot I guess about uh, about Greek mythology, which happened before I moved to Greece. I studied classics and met my husband, who is Greek. There's a Greek mythology and Greekness, I guess, is sort of is my destiny. <laughs> and um, one of the myths that I revisit again and again and again, which I guess is what revisit means, <laughs> um, is the myth of uh, Hades and Persephone. Um, which the poets have always uh, enjoyed um, using. And uh, I, I'm sure you all remember the myth. It's, it's maybe a version of Little Red Riding Hood, let's say, and um, this uh, nymph, that is to say a young girl, um, is out in the field picking flowers. Her mother happens to be the goddess of the earth. That's a, a background. And um, the god of the underworld, who also happens to be her uncle, um, falls madly in love with her and takes her down into the underworld. You all remember all this and the pomegranate, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I've written various poems about this. This particular one is from the point of view of Persephone, and she is writing a letter to her mother, Demeter, and um, about what it's like in the underworld. So um, maybe a kind of unhappy letter from camp. Persephone writes a letter to her mother. First, hell is not so far underground. My hair gets tangled in the roots of trees, and I can just make out the crunch of footsteps, the pop of acorns falling, or the chime of a shovel squaring a fresh grave, or turning up the tulip bulbs for separation. Day and night, creatures with no legs, or too many, journey to hell and back. Alas. The burrowing animals have dim eyesight. They are useless for news of the upper world. They say the light is loud. Their figures of speech all come from sound. Their hearing is acute. The dead are just as dull as you would imagine. They evolve like the burrowing animals losing their sight. They may roam abroad sometimes, but just at night. They can only tell me if there was a moon. Again and again, moth-like, 
They are duped by any beckoning flame, lamps, and candles. They come back startled and singed, sucking their fingers, happy the dirt is cool and dense and blind. They are silly and grateful and don't remember anything. I have tried to tell them stories, but they cannot attend. They pester you like children for the wrong details. How long were his fingernails? Did she wear shoes? How much did they eat for breakfast? What is snow? And then they pay no attention to the answers. My husband, bored with their babbling, neither listens nor speaks. But here there is no fodder for small talk. The weather is always the same. Nothing happens. Though at times I feel the trees rocking in place like grief, clenching the dirt with tortuous toes. There is nothing to eat here but raw beets and turnips. There is nothing to drink but mud-filtered rain. Of course, no one goes hungry or toils, however many. The dead breed like the bulbs of daffodils, without sex or seed, all underground. Yet no race has such increase, worse than insects. I miss you and think about you often. Please send flowers. I am forgetting them. If I yank them down by the roots, they lose their petals and smell of compost. Though I try to describe their color and fragrance, no one here believes me. They think they are the same thing as mushrooms. Yet no dog is so loyal as the dead, who have no wives or children, and no lives, no motives, secret or bare to disobey. Plus, my husband is a kind, kind master. He asks nothing of us, Nothing, nothing at all. Thus fall changes to winter, winter to fall, while we learn idleness, a difficult lesson. He does not understand why I write letters. He says that you will never get them. True, mulched leaf paper sticks together, then rots. No ink but blood, and it turns brown like the leaves. He found my stash of letters, for I had hid it, thinking he'd be angry, but he never angers. He took my hands in his hands, my shredded fingers, which I have sliced for ink, thin paper cuts. My effort is futile, he says, and doesn't forbid it. This is a, another poem about the same situation um, in, a, in a different form. This is actually a, a traditional form that um, the students among us and the former students among us, which pretty much covers everyone, um, will, uh, will remember. Um, it will be very familiar to them. So this is a, a particular form. First love, a quiz. He came up to me, A, in his souped-up Camaro, B, to talk to my skinny best friend, C, and bumped my glass of wine so I wore the fairest stain on my sleeve, D, from the ground in a lead chariot drawn by a team of stallions, black as crude oil and breathing sulfur, at his heart he sported a tiny golden arrow. He offered me, A, a ride. B, dinner and a movie with a wink at the cliché. C, an excuse not to go back alone to the apartment with its sink of dirty knives. D, a narcissus with a hundred dazzling petals that breathed a sweetness as cloying as decay. I went with him because, A, even his friends told me to beware. B, I had nothing to lose except my virginity. C, he placed his hand in the small of my back and I felt the tread of honeybees. D, he was my uncle, the one who lived in the half-finished basement and he took me by the hair. The place he took me to, A, was dark as my shut eyes. B, and where I ate bitter seed and became ripe. C, and from which my mother would never take me wholly back, though she wept and walked the earth and made the bearded ears of barley wither on their stalks and the blasted flowers drop from their sepals. D, 
is called by some men hell and others love. E, all of the above. I, I've mentioned this before at other readings. My, my poems tend to fall into two categories, poems with short titles and poems with long titles. And this is a long titled poem. The Athens in the title, which I feel I do have to mention here, is Athens, Greece. <laughs> I had actually had that originally in the title, and they said, well, people will know that it's Athens, Greece. I'm like, not in Atlanta. <laughs> you might think it is Athens, Georgia. No, it's obvious that it's Athens, Greece. I just automatically put yeah, Athens. Um, and uh, this is about a, a museum exhibition um, of all of the things that they had found when they were digging the new stations for the Athens Metro, preparing for the 2004 Olympics. And anywhere you build in Athens, you've got to call in the emergency archaeologists um, to, uh, to get the finds before they you know, dig and blast everything up. And um, sometimes I find in these, uh, I really like quirky museum exhibits or small museums. As, as, uh, as you were saying, uh, too many paintings or too many objects, especially masterpieces, and you just you can't take it anymore. And so I like sort of small, quirky things. And this was one um, where I wasn't so much moved by the art as the everyday objects. And the thing that touched me the most was, um, was a very carefully made grave for a dog. An ancient dog grave unearthed during construction of the Athens Metro. It is not the curled up bones, nor even the grave that stops me, but the blue beads on the collar whose leather has long gone the way of hides, the ones to ward off evil. A careful master even now protects a favorite just so. But what evil could she suffer after death? I picture the loyal companion, bereaved of her master, trotting the long dark way that slopes to the river, nearly trampled by all the nations marching down, one war after another, flood or famine, her paws sucked by the thick collegianous mud, deep as her dew claws near the river bank. In the press for the ferry, who will lift her into the boat? Will she cower under the pier and be forgotten, forever howling and whimpering, tail tucked under? What stranger pays her passage? Perhaps she swims, dog paddling the current of oblivion. A shake as she scrambles ashore sets the beads jingling. And then that last tense moment, touching noses once, twice, three times with unleashed Cerberus. You can hold your applause. Um, and that one of the surprises of moving to Greece, um, or it was a big surprise in 99, um, was how seismically active it is. And um, there was a very, a, a quite big earthquake, re, rather a few months after we had moved there. And um, I'd never been in an earthquake and found it very, very alarming. And especially the aftershocks. Um, which I didn't understand could be up to, the, I guess, the, the magnitude of the original earthquake, but maybe shorter in duration. That sounds right. And um, so that at any time, this, this horrible, for me, it was a very traumatic experience, would just keep happening. And um, I, <laughs> I was uh, very upset about it, but it did result in a poem, so it's okay. <laughs> Aftershocks. We are not in the same place after all. The only evidence of the disaster mapping out across the bedroom wall, tiny cracks still fissuring the plaster, a new cartography for us to master in whose legend we read where we are bound, terra infirma, a stranger land and vaster, or have we always stood on shaky ground? The moment keeps on happening, a sound, the floor beneath us swings, a pendulum that clocks the heart. The heart so tightly wound, we fall mute, as when two lovers come to the brink of the apology and halt, each standing on the wrong side of the fault.
Um, and uh, I'll give you the three poem warning <laughs> so you can relax. Um, this is a short titled poem. Fragment. The glass does not break because it is glass, said the philosopher. The glass could stay unbroken forever, shoved back in a dark closet, slowly weeping itself a colorless liquid. The glass breaks because somebody drops it from a height, a grip stunned open by bad news or laughter, a giddy sweep of grand gesture, or fluttering nerves might knock it off the table, or perhaps wine emptied from it into the blood has numbed the fingers. It breaks because it falls into the arms of the earth, that grave attraction. It breaks because it meets the floor's surface, which is solid and does not give. It breaks because it is dropped and falls hard, because it hits bottom, and because nobody catches it. I thought I'd read a, what I consider a very Atlanta poem. Um, I... Uh, I, the, the Michael C. Carlos Museum is a wonderful museum, beautifully curated. But I don't know how many of you remember the old Emory Museum, the old, the, with all the strange objects. I don't know, a couple of people. Anyway, it's full of really, really, I, as a poet, I guess I'm more interested in, in odd objects than necessarily um, beautifully rendered history and so forth. I mean, it's just, I don't know, attracted to odd things. Um, so I uh, wrote a little poem for those kinds of museums, such as the one at the Capitol with its uh, strange objects. Two-headed snakes and so on. Which is great if you're a kid. This is an ubisunt lament for the eccentric museums of my childhood. Orphaned oddments crammed in university basements, in corridors of state capitals, identified by jaundiced index cards, I think about you now. Where have the curators of new collections stashed you? A clutch of geodes cracked like dragon eggs in mid-metamorphosis, coins trite from dead hands, the two-headed calf floating in amniotic of formaldehyde. Where is Doc Holliday's old dentist chair? The lone token mummy, sand sarcophagus, all unraveling bandages. On dares we looked up his double-barreled nose at cocked eternity. Is he under wraps now, x-rayed with a puffed-up provenance, rewound, educational? Curators, where are the lost curiosities stranded at random on times littered literal? Why, we used to muse, did this thing, not that, survive its gone moment? How are they filed away? I don't know if... Uh, there were some biographies of Edna St. Vincent Millay that came out uh, recently. I didn't read uh, both of them, but I read Savage Beauty. And um, as you know, Edna St. Vincent Millay wrote these, these very powerful but also very accomplished, um, uh, very beautiful sonnets. Um, but uh, reading these, biograph these biographies, her life was um, very chaotic and disordered and depraved. And, <laughs> um, and I was asked by a magazine, this is one of the wonderful things about journals, sometimes they, they actually inspire poems. Um, th they, wanted to, they were doing an issue about women's writers writing about other women's writers, and I think they wanted really serious things. And I sent this in, and they weren't sure about it. After reading the biography, Savage Beauty. I'd like to write sonnets a dozen a day. Compose a libretto and maybe a play. My lustrous red hair would be crowned with the bay if I were like Edna, St. Vincent Millay. <laughs> I'd like to have lovers, both straight ones and gay, for I would hold both sexes under my sway and not give two figs about what people say if I were like Edna, St. Vincent Millay. I'd like to throw tantrums and get my own way. 
I'd like to be fresh as a young Beaujolais. I'd be as bewitching as Morgan Le Fay if I were like Edna, said Vincent Millet. I'd move with the grace of one trained in ballet. My husband would not only love, but obey. <laughs> People would flock to my readings and pay. <laughs> if I were like Edna, St. Vincent Millet. 